Today I'm answering this CIE IGCSE biology paper and it's the paper 6 alternative to practical. Question 1. Figure 1.1 shows a section through an unfertilized chicken's egg. The egg is made up of the outer shell, inner yellow yolk and albumin, egg white. The albumin and yolk are composed of different substances including fats. Describe how ethanol can be used to test a sample of food for the presence of fat. Provide the result for the positive test and it's worth 3 marks. If we're looking at fat and it involves ethanol, then it must be the ethanol emulsion test. Remember that in order to do that, you add your sample to a test tube containing ethanol and water. And then you have to shake it. If you have fat, then you'll see a milky white suspension. And that's obviously your positive result. B. A student was given a sample of albumin. They tested the sample for reducing sugars by carrying out the steps shown. A syringe was used to put 2 cm cubed of albumin suspension into a test tube. 2 cm cubed of Benedict's reagent was added. The solutions were mixed thoroughly by gently shaking the test tube. State the next step required to complete the test for reducing sugars, which remember include things like glucose. You must learn the test for glucose, which is that you add Benedict's reagent to it and then you heat it in a water bath. And so that's going to be your next step. Heat solutions in a water bath. Describe a positive result for the presence of reducing sugars. You'll see a brick red precipitate. Proteins can be broken down by protease enzymes. Enzymes are also made out of protein. A student investigated the effect of acid on the breakdown of albumin by protease enzyme. Three test tubes, P, Q and R, were prepared. The volumes of the substances added to the test tubes are shown in table 1.1. So in P, we've got the protein, the albumin, some water, no acid, no enzyme. In Q, we've got albumin, distilled water and enzyme. R, we have albumin, acid and enzyme. The test tubes were placed in a water bath at 40 degrees for 10 minutes. After 10 minutes, the test tubes were removed from the water bath and placed in a test tube rack. Two centimetres cubed of birase solution was added to each test tube. The appearance of the solution in each test tube was observed. The student's observations are shown in figure 1.2. P is a purple colour. Remember if you're looking at by ray solution, it turns purple when you've got protein. So the simple fact that P and Q are both purple means that both solutions must have contained protein. R is blue means that you've got a negative result. I do like making notes to myself so I know what's going on. Prepare a table to record the observations shown in figure 1.2. It's going to be quite a simple table. We need to mention the various test tubes as well as the colours that they've turned. So I think you'll need two columns. The test tube, the right hand column observation. You've got P, Q and R. For the first two they went purple. And the final result was blue. State of conclusion for these results. Well, I've already done that inadvertently up here. We can say that P and Q contain protein and that R does not. Identify the variable that was changed, the independent variable in this investigation. I've already underlined it at the top. A student investigated the effect of acid. So our variable here is acid. State the purpose of test tube P in this investigation. If we look at P, it doesn't contain either acid or enzyme, so we know that it's simply acting as a control. Suggest why one centimetre cubed of distilled water was added to test tube Q. If we look at the various volumes added, we can see that there's 4 in P, 4 centimetres cubed in Q, and 4 in R. So it's effectively to make up the volume and make sure that it's 4 for each. A student used only one syringe to prepare the solutions in test tubes P, Q and R in step 1. Explain why this is a potential source of error and how it could affect the results. 
So in order to understand this, we need to look at what that syringe is being used to measure. Well, it's being used to measure the amount of albumin, the distilled water, the acid, and the enzyme. So hopefully you can see that in P, if that syringe had originally been used in R to measure out both the acid and the enzyme, then by the time it's measuring out the volume to P, there could be cross-contamination. So despite the fact that there's not supposed to be any acid or enzyme in P, certainly there could be some due to residual acid and enzyme left from Q. So we're going to point out that there could have been cross-contamination. P could potentially contain acid and enzyme when it's not supposed to. Identify one potential safety hazard in this investigation. Well, remember there's acid, which is corrosive and could damage eyes. Figure 2.1 is a photomicrograph showing a cross-section of an artery. Make a large drawing of the artery in figure 2.1 to show the layers that make up the artery wall. Do not draw individual cells. Figure 2.2 shows a photomicrograph of cross-sections of an artery and vein. The diameter of the artery is indicated by the line AB. Measure the length of line AB on figure 2.2. Include the unit. So use your ruler to measure the length of this line. It's up to you which unit you use. I think millimetres is probably the most sensible. So once you've measured that, it will be 37 millimetres or 3.7 centimetres if you're that way inclined. Calculate the actual diameter of the artery using your measurement and the formula magnification equals length of line AB divided by actual diameter of the artery. Give your answer to two significant figures, include the unit. Do make sure you obey all parts of the question. Look, it's worth three marks. So first of all, we need to rearrange that equation to find the actual diameter of the artery, which you can see is therefore length of the line AB divided by magnification. The length of the line we've discerned as being 37 millimetres. Divide it by the magnification, which we're told here is 13. Once you pop that into your calculator to two significant figures, the answer is 2.8 millimetres. Describe one similarity and one difference between the artery and the vein shown in figure 2.2. Make sure you're stating something that you can see on the diagram. Well, you can see that they're both made up of many layers of muscle and elastic fibres. The biggest thing to notice in terms of their differences is the width of that lumen. It's huge in the vein and much smaller in the artery. So both walls are made up of several layers of muscle and elastic fibres. The difference is the width of the lumen. Veins have wider lumens. A person investigated the change in their pulse rate before and after exercise. The person measured their pulse before exercise, during and after exercise. The results are shown in table 2.1. Calculate the percentage increase in the pulse rate from minute 6 before exercise to minute 12 during exercise. Give your answer to the nearest whole number. Okay, so we're looking for percentage increase, which is really the same as percentage change. So you're looking at change in pulse rate divided by original pulse rate multiplied by 100 because it's a percent. So make sure you pull out the right numbers here. So we're looking at pulse rate, so this column from minute 6, which is 78 beats per minute, all the way up to 160, because we're looking at these key numbers after 6 minutes and 12 minutes. So work out your change in pulse rate by doing 160 minus 78. Divide it by that original pulse rate, which we know is 78, multiply by 100, and your final answer here is 105. Plot a line graph on the grid of time against pulse rate for the results shown in table 2.1. So let's work out what needs to go on which axis. The pulse rate is what you're measuring, so it's your dependent variable. And that means it needs to go on the y-axis. Your time is what you're changing, so it's your independent variable, which, remember, must go on the x-axis. Now you must make sure you pick a sensible scale. Don't forget your labels and your units. So in terms of your time in minutes, it needs to go from 2 minutes up to 18. You need to occupy as much of the graph paper as possible. That looks like a nice scale to me.
in terms of your pulse rate, we're starting at 78 and we're going all the way up to 160. So I'm going to go up in 50s. Now we're ready to plot that graph line. So from minute 2 to 6, our pulse rate is 78. At minute 8, we go up to 125. 10 is 148. 12 is 160. 14 is 154. 16 is 122. 18 is 94. Use a straight line to join up your dots. Use your graph to estimate the pulse rate of the person in 15 minutes. Show on your graph how you obtained your answer. So we need to read up at 15 minutes, which is here. I'm drawing a line on my graph because it wants me to show my working. And then I'm going to read across on my y-axis to work out what that number is. I think that's around 138 beats per minute. Describe the results of the person's investigation. When you're describing results, you're saying what you see. And so you can see from the graph that the pulse rate remains constant before exercise, and that's the flat horizontal line seen here. Then we can see that it rises during exercise before gradually falling off, and then even after exercise, it doesn't reach its resting level. So we want to make three separate points. So pulse rate remains constant before exercise. Pulse rate increases during exercise before falling, pulse rate does not return to its resting value after 18 minutes. And remember you could state data to back up your findings. Plan an investigation to find out how running at different speeds affects pulse rate. So you know I like to use the variables layout if you've been following me for a while, so we're going to have to list our independent variable. Sorry, my handwriting's terrible because I'm cold. Which is what you're changing. And that's obviously the speed. And then we're going to list our dependent variable, which is what we're measuring. And that's obviously going to be pulse rate. So the independent variable we need to state is that the subject will run at different speeds. And maybe even specify what those would be. 5 miles per hour, 7 miles per hour, 9 miles per hour. What's your dependent variable? So what are you measuring? I will measure the subject's pulse rate before exercise and every minute during exercise and for five minutes afterwards. What are our control variables? So what do we need to keep the same? I will keep the following the same. So pick anything sensible here. So in terms of the subject, the subject Pick a gender, must be male, it's important that they're basically the same age, so let's say 20 years of age. And I know we're looking at different speeds, but it's important that they're running the same distance each time. So one kilometre each time. Let's add a few extra details. Measure the pulse rates on the wrist using a pulse rate monitor. And don't forget to state that you need to repeat and calculate an average. You must always say that. It's probably good to say how many times you're going to repeat it, so at least three times. 